In the spring of 1841, former President John Quincy Adams stood before the United States Supreme Court. Two years earlier, a group of Africans had been kidnapped from their homes and brought to Cuba. Faced with a future as slaves, the captives staged a rebellion, taking over the Spanish ship La Amistad and demanding that their captors return them to their homeland. Unfortunately, the Africans were tricked into sailing to Long Island, New York. They were then thrown into jail, where they waited for the next two years as their case worked its way through the United States federal court system. The Spanish government and American President Martin Van Buren were both working to return the Africans to Cuba, where they would face slavery or even death. John Quincy Adams was determined not to let that happen. He argued relentlessly before the Supreme Court for the Africans to be cleared of charges of piracy and murder. In his historic argument, Adams dramatically pointed to the Declaration of Independence hanging on the courtroom wall. He's forcefully stated, the moment you come to the Declaration of Independence, that every man has a right to life and liberty as an inalienable right, this case is decided. And it was. The Supreme Court declared the Africans free to go. The next fall, a group of American missionaries accompanied the former slaves back to their homes in Africa. John Quincy Adams' pivotal role in the Amistad case earned him a great deal of respect and appreciation from the abolitionist movement. But his anti-slavery beliefs had not always been so apparent. Born in Braintree, Massachusetts on July 11, 1767, John Quincy was raised by parents who believed that slavery was fundamentally evil. He was also raised to be a true patriot. While his father was working to establish the new American nation, a seven-year-old John Quincy and his mother witnessed the Battle of Bunker Hill from atop the family farm. John Quincy's mother was the primary influence in his childhood. A woman of unwavering principles and a deep inner strength, Abigail Adams ran the family farm all on her own while her husband was away on diplomatic missions. Abigail never employed slave labor in her household, and her correspondence with her husband reveals deep derision for Southern slaveholders. She even sent a black slave boy to one of the local night schools, despite strong community objections. After exposure to his mother's anti-slavery views, a teenage John Quincy began to accompany his father overseas as a secretary. On one such trip in 1779, John Quincy began the diary that he would faithfully fill with his personal reflections until his death. He had learned to be thoughtful and to stick to his convictions from his mother. But his father, the former president and accomplished diplomat, seemed to leave his personal beliefs out of his public persona, doing his best to avoid the issue of slavery altogether. Since John Quincy's political career began overseas in the 1790s as a minister to the Netherlands, Portugal, and Prussia, he too was able to remain publicly neutral on the domestic issue of slavery for many years. In 1794, on a diplomatic mission in London, John Quincy met and fell in love with Louisa Catherine Johnson. In 1797, they married in a London church, the beginning of a strong, enduring union. Sometime later, John, Louisa, and their three sons became very close to an African-American school teacher named Sanders. Sanders often accompanied the Adams children on day trips from their Massachusetts home, and Adams supported Sanders' project of establishing a school system in Haiti by helping him ob obtain passports and offering advice where he could. Adams also kept in touch with a number of blacks through letters, sometimes going so far as to send money to freed blacks and slaves whose liberties were being violated. Despite his anti-slavery upbringing and his own friendships with blacks, John Quincy's presidential ambitions eventually pushed him to avoid the appearance of being soft on slavery. As a young senator in the early 1800s, Adam publicly agreed that slavery was a moral evil, but seemed to rush this aside by admitting that, as connected with commerce, it has its uses. When discussing abolishing the slave trade in the District of Columbia, he argued that it would be useless because slaveholders would simply move their slave property elsewhere. As the chief American negotiator during the Treaty of Ghent, Adams argued that Southern slaveholders should receive restitution for so-called slave property lost in the War of 1812. Not surprisingly, these positions did not do much to build warm relations between Adams and the anti-slavery movement. But Adams justified his dissent by saying, my principles and my position make it necessary for me to be more circumspect in my conduct. Adams' political goals were fueled in large part by his undying love for the Union and his utter faith in the Founding Fathers and the Constitution. Unfortunately, it took him many years to reconcile his passion for preserving the Union with his personal distaste for slavery. This development did not come about until long after his work as a foreign diplomat, after his years in the Senate, after his time as Secretary of State, and after his presidency. Adams didn't emerge as a champion of the anti-slavery movement until he joined the House of Representatives in 1831. In a truly unique career move for a former president, Adams used his position as a United States congressman to make incredible progress for the anti-slavery movement. 
He saw that slavery was threatening his beloved union, and he immediately moved to action. When Adams joined the House, Congress was dealing with an overwhelming number of anti-slavery petitions coming in from all across the country. In theory, petitioning provided every American with a voice in Congress, regardless of societal status. Not surprisingly, women took particular advantage of this form of speech. As an oppressed group, they were sympathetic to the plight of blacks in America. The House was inundated with anti-slavery petitions, mostly with female signatures. The House responded by instituting a gag rule in 1836, which prevented any anti-slavery petitions from being considered on the floor. Adams countered this move by beginning to submit as many anti-slavery petitions as possible. In the summer of 1838, Adams stood before his fellow congressmen and spoke every day for three weeks straight on the evils of slavery. Relieved of the pressures of his presidency and perhaps inspired by his new duties as a representative of the American people, Adams was finally able to express his opposition to slavery. He had also begun to see that the law could be used to further the abolitionist movement, and he took full advantage of any and all parliamentary procedures that circumvented the gag rule and allowed petitions to be heard. In an appeal to the House on June 16, 1838, Adams said, When the meanest portion of the lowest and poorest individual of the country, I will not say slave, is presented in this House and referred, I hold it the duty of the committee to the House, to the country, and to the petitioners to look into the petition before they make up their opinion. This was in response to a fellow congressman's admission that he did not read petitions referred to his committee because he had already made up his own mind on the subject. Adams called upon his peers to remember their duty to the people of the United States to hear every voice and consider every viewpoint. This included the female voice. It is worth noting that Adams did not defend petitions submitted by slaves. Though he had now effectively joined the anti-slavery movement, it was still in his nature to be realistic. After eight years of hard work, the gag rule was appealed in 1844. Adams' opposition to the gag rule in the late 1830s and his work on the Amistad case in the early 1840s are representative of Adams' overall approach to abolition, which was to temper his passions with what he interpreted as the demands of the Constitution. He worked with the system, through both the legislative and the judicial branches, to bring about the positive changes he sought. Even his most extreme suggestion, that civil war was a possible solution to the slavery issue, stemmed from the fact that this would activate the War Powers Clause and give Congress the ability to abolish slavery in the southern states. Adams never strayed from his dedication to the Union and the laws intended to preserve it. It just took him some time to achieve cohesion among all of his varying beliefs. Without John Quincy Adams advocating its principles, it is unlikely that the abolitionist movement would have received the same voice in Congress or would have been acknowledged with the same respect that it was granted by Adams' power and prestige. And he kept fighting literally until the very end. Adams died on February 23, 1848, after suffering a massive stroke during a floor debate. The House had been debating honors to be awarded veterans of the Mexican-American War. Adams saw this war as a deplorable attempt to gain more slave territory and had violently opposed it from the very beginning. When the matter was brought to a vote on that fateful day, Adams rose from his seat to shout, no. He collapsed immediately thereafter and was carefully removed to the Speaker's chamber. He died two days later with his loving wife and only surviving son by his side. But in the House chamber that day was a young congressman named Abraham Lincoln, a man who would someday secure the realization of John Quincy Adams' vision of a more just future for the union he so loved.